my young friends i find myself in a very unusual situation where the students can see me but i cannot see the students i also don't know what time of the day it is when you are watching this video i don't know whether to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening but one thing i know for sure i know what kind of people you are see presently i am a retired scientist i retired 9 years ago but i have been a teacher for many years at iit kanpur and iit kharagpur and have taught hundreds of students in those institutions and elsewhere i especially have always vibed very well with the undergraduate students and i have found that basically every class was so very similar there are always some students who are very sincere they take down notes copious notes i mean if i make if i utter one sentence they write down three sentences there are some students who are never looking at me they are looking at the walls or through the windows but somehow i can sense they are listening means i have asked them some questions later and they could respond very positively on the other hand there have always been students who would be looking at me but they would be very blank faces means they they may be hearing at the most but they wouldn't listen and obviously there would be some students who would rather be elsewhere now as a teacher most of us who have been teachers would like to connect with those people a few people who are listening and through them we connect with the class so i assume that there is there somebody there with whom i am i am making a connection and who will enjoy at least try to enjoy whatever he is learning but the, right in the beginning let me say one thing very clearly that if you try to enjoy or try to learn then you would like the course and if you like the course you try to learn so it's a process that goes on if right from the beginning if you take an attitude that you know this is a course of rather I'm not interested in then you'll find it's not a course which is interesting to you now i must admit that this course doesn't have a very good reputation in the sense that many think non ferrous metallurgy is a very boring subject they are not very wrong because the way uh, it was taught at one time was very wrong people would take one metal at a time talk about ores and minerals and uh, talk about methods of extraction their uses then move on to the another metal and this makes it very descriptive and i don't think any student would be interested in this if it is information to be given a student may very well say when well, the information is in the book why do you have to come to the class if necessary i will read the book and pick it up so as a teacher i wouldn't like to give you information because it's in the book somewhere in some place you can find it i would rather try to give you the principles that govern extraction process of non ferrous metallurgy some logic in in the subject and if you get the logic then the subject is fun if you don't get the logic it it will be a descriptive course and remember that this course in the undergraduate years uh, has to compete with some fantastic other courses where there is so much of quantification beautiful concepts there is mathematics you know in thermodynamics in kinetics in microstructures crystallography metal forming 
the principles of dislocation, beautiful concepts and, and there are also wonderful laboratories which substantiate what you learn in the class. Now to compete with that, non ferrous metallurgy has to come up with a logic of its own, has to tell the students why he should also take non ferrous metallurgy seriously. I will try to do that. I do not know how much I will succeed, but definitely I will try to give you the logic of the processes rather than the details of the processes. I, I will try to avoid the details. I will have to give you some flow sheets and some chemical equations because informations are necessary. They will be in the records, but I would not expect you to remember them all. When you will need, you can always find that out. But understand why certain things are done in a certain way and not in another way. Now, when I joined IIT Kanpur, Mm, was way back 1967. The, the first assignment given to me was non ferrous teaching of non ferrous extractive metallurgy to undergraduate students. I know they are very bright people, and the, uh, the thing was taught, I think, in the fourth year. And I didn't know the subject, so I asked some of my colleagues why you are not teaching it because you, you, you obviously you are knowledgeable, more knowledgeable, you are more senior. But I understood that nobody wanted to teach the course because they all thought it was a very boring subject and there were not very many good books either. I went to the library and I saw some books. They read like encyclopedias. A famous book which was followed at that time as a textbook was by Bray. That book started with aluminum. The logic is aluminum starts with A and it ended with zinc because it, it starts with Z. Now, had aluminum been called zaluminium, it would have gone to the end and had zinc been called something with A, it would have been discussed first. This I thought was ridiculous and I, I thought the book gave information, but it was it is not a book uh, which, uh, which can be used for teaching. So, we uh, I started writing a book and finally, with the two other colleagues of mine, I have written, uh, I wrote this book that's way back, it was published in 84, Extraction of Non-Ferrous Metals by H. S. Ray, R. Sridhar and K. P. Abraham. I would follow this book to a large extent. It, it, it was published by Affiliated East West Press Private Limited. It has not been revised in last uh, 25 years and it is going into 13th print. So, many of the data given are old, but the principles are not old, the principles remain the same, but I will certainly update uh, as I go on. So, as I said, uh, we have tried to give a logic for this course in this book and to that I will come little later. The logic is simply this that I will try to disc put all these metals in some groups and there will be four or five groups. They will be discussed in terms of their occurrence in nature, because if they occur in nature in, 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 in one form, the processes for their extraction would be governed by one logic than if they were present in another form. So, that is the whole idea. But before I proceed, uh, just a little bit about my introduction, where I was earlier and everywhere I was very much concerned with non ferrous metallurgy. Now, let me give you right discuss two equations to tell you how when we write an equation in non ferrous metallurgy, uh, we are not doing what we do in chemistry. Now, had this been a course in chemistry, I would have said that uh, sodium can be uh, titanium can be produced by reduction of titanium tetrachloride by magnesium or reduction of titanium tetrachloride by sodium and period. Then I will proceed to something else. But actually here, once I write these equations, I start thinking of something quite different than what a chemist will do. I like to ask this question, why is it that in 
Kroll's process for magnesium reduction, we get a product which is powdery, which is spongy, which is not a solid metal. Whereas, in the Hunter's process, we find that we get a crystalline product, means which can be straight away rolled, made into a sheet. Why should this difference be there? And there is a very interesting reason. I am not going to discuss everything now, but I will hint at it. Now, you look at the first reaction, that is Kroll's process. It is what we call a termolecular equation in a condensed phase. One molecule of titanium chloride finds two atoms of magnesium and forms a titanium atom and magnesium chloride, the bulk. And there are atoms of titanium being produced one after another. There is no reason why they should be consolidated. They remain separated. They produce a spongy mass. Whereas, in the Hunter's process, actually the way this reaction is written is not the way the reaction takes place. Because, if you look at it, what the reaction says is that you have a gas phase and one molecule of titanium tetrachloride, which is moving around, finds four atoms of sodium at one place and the reaction takes place. What is the probability of four atoms of sodium and one molecule of titanium tetrachloride to come to one point? Probability, I think, is non-existent. This reaction cannot take place like this because pentamolecular reaction in a gas phase is not what you expect to occur. Then what, what would be the other uh, uh, way of doing things? I propose that it does not occur like that. Actually, there are simpler reactions that take place. Like sodium reacts with one molecule of titanium tetrachloride, produces a subhalide titanium trichloride, which dissolves in sodium chloride. Then sodium reacts with titanium trichloride, that is in the liquid, produces another sub subhalide titanium dichloride and sodium chloride. Maybe some sodium also dissolves to some extent in the, uh, in, in the liquid state and reactions take place there. Now, can I give a proof that these things happen? People have found, yes, these phases have been found in sodium chloride phase. They are transient phases. I mean, they come and go. So, the sum and substance is that the reaction of reduction of titanium tetrachloride by sodium is not taking place in the vapor phase. It is actually taking place in the sodium chloride phase through formation of subhalides. When we write the pentamolecular reaction, it is an overall reaction period, but that does not give the mechanism of the reaction. Now, once you understand the mechanism, which is the reactions occurring in the liquid phase, then there is something more interesting um, facets of the reaction come about and we will show that later. Actually, it is an electrochemical reaction and because of that electrochemical reaction, titanium is not produced atom by atom, but it is produced by an electrochemical reaction in a very consolidated crystal form, like happens in all electrochemical processes. So, you see that just writing a reaction is not enough in, in process metallurgy. You have to understand the mechanism behind it. Let me proceed to another reaction, another uh, reaction. Many oxides and as we have written M X O Y can be reduced by aluminum because aluminum forms a more stable oxide L 2 O 3 and it releases the metal. An example is you can take F E 2 O 3 mixed with aluminum powder and all that one has to do is simply to ignite it. There are many methods of igniting. Just a small part of it should become heated to 900 degrees or so. And then the reaction proceeds, it is highly exothermic and then it becomes autogenous, 
means you don't have to supply any more heat. It will continue, not only continue, it actually can sometimes be become explosive because so much of heat is generated. And we might have to control the reaction by keeping their excess of metal M, which so that it can uh, absorb some heat and control the reaction. This kind of reaction is used in a very interesting process called thermit process. A thermit mixture is made by mixing aluminum powder and iron oxide, sometimes even pure iron ore. And this can be used to weld cracks in railway tracks, in rails. You find there is a crack, so you make a mold around it, put this mixture and simply ignite it. Reaction takes place, molten iron produced fills the gap and the rail is welded. On the spot you can do this, you do not have to bring a furnace or anything. You just need a device to ignite and there are many ways of putting uh, initial heat. Now, this is not the only reaction, aluminum as well as calcium, both of them form stable oxides can reduce many metal oxides. Now, we might be tempted to think that these reactions are very favorable from energy point of view, because once started, you do not have to supply any more heat, it goes on producing heat. But the fact is, this is a wrong way of looking at things. We are being very short sighted. The question to be answered is to make it energy favorable from the point of view of energy, we also have to ask the question how much energy is required to produce aluminum, which is a reducing agent. Now, it so happens aluminum needs a lot of energy to be produced. So, if you take that energy into account, then it is not a very good process from the energy point of view. We analyze such reactions now, all reactions now by using a term called process fuel equivalent. We take into account all the energy that goes into production of the raw materials input side. Then we take into account the exothermic heat that is coming out. We also take into account the sensible heat of the products, maybe there are gases that will come out and from where we may be able to extract some sensible heat. All that taken into account can be used to define a term called process fuel equivalent, based on which only we can talk about energy, uh, whether the process is favorable point of view of energy. This process is not favorable point of view of the energy. So, these, these are the way uh, uh, we will analyze things. Now, before I proceed further, let me first define what is a non-ferrous metal. Now, obviously, non-ferrous metal is a metal which is not ferrous, but one has to say a little more on that. If you look at the periodic table, which has more than 90 elements, many of them are obviously not metals, like you have inert gases, you have other gases, nitrogen, then you have chlorine, bromine, fluorine, you eliminate them. Then there are some elements which are non-metals, carbon for example, iodine, they may be solid, they are non-metals. If you eliminate them, you are left with about more than 60 elements which are considered non-metals. You know what is the definition of the metal? Metal normally we say is something which has a luster, we call it a metallic luster which have some mechanical properties, which is have some strength, etc., etc. Of course, there are some exceptions like mercury. Mercury is classified as a metal, it is a metallic luster, but it is not a solid. Whatever it is, there are some more than 60 non-ferrous metals. Now, we are going to talk about extraction of most of them, but not one by one, we will we'll put them in groups. And very often, if you have understood the extraction of one or two, you can very well guess how the other metals in that group will be extracted. Now, we are going to take another class of alloys, which combine ferrous and non-ferrous. These are 
ferro alloys like there are alloys which contain iron and nickel we call ferro nickel similarly we have ferro manganese ferro molybdenum ferro chromium ferro silicon we will discuss how these are also produced the reason is the reason is that many non ferrous metals which go into ferro alloys are mostly produced as ferro alloys and not as in the elemental form like this more demand of ferro nickel than nickel of ferro chrome than chromium because these ferro alloys are used to add these alloying elements nickel chromium vanadium manganese into steel and you know steel acquire special properties because it has non ferrous metals in, in, in various amounts like you know you want to produce uh, stainless steel you need definitely need chromium and nickel they will be added to molten steel as ferro alloys not as chromium or nickel so the industry in the industry it is much more advantageous to produce the ferro alloy itself which also dissolves very fast because it it has a low melting point so we don't we never add nickel or chromium in elemental form to form ferro alloys to form steel with these metals we add ferro alloys so we'll discuss ferro alloys also now long ago actually uh, in uh, 1907 i think radiard cap kipling who was the first nobel laureate in english literature uh, wrote these lines i do not know in what context he wrote these lines but i thought uh, i i should quote the lines here gold for the mistress silver for the maid copper for the craftsman cunning at his trade good said the baron sitting in his hall but iron cold iron is master of the ball now this poem makes non ferrous metals a poor cousin poor cousins of iron steel which is not a very fair statement because it is true that more than 90% of all metals used today are iron steel ferrous but it does not mean that the non ferrous metals are not important because there are many alloys without which today civilization simply cannot exist and there you need non ferrous metals to start it think of the airplanes the spacecrafts which are based on aluminum and titanium because these metals are light and strong you cannot make aeroplanes out of steel or you cannot make aircrafts space crafts out of steel there you need titanium aluminum also some other elements electrical applications need copper because copper is a very good conductor of electricity silver is even better uh, conductor but you know silver is expensive so you cannot have silver wires but there are some critical um, contacts electrical contacts where silver is to be used similarly all metals um, have very critical applications and will come to uh, their uses when you talk about them precious metals gold silver platinum palladium not only they are very good for making ornaments of course people these days are making ornaments out of uh, steel also but you know uh, a woman would rather have gold and silver than steel to wear around her neck but these precious metals make fantastic catalysts for critical reactions especially platinum and palladium there are also other uses so though iron steel is the basis of our civilization we need to have these precious metals now to show you the importance of iron and steel vis-a-vis um, vis -vis non ferrous metals let me just say that today the world produces 1350 million tons of steel that's more than 1000 million tons of which india produces 40 million tons or so which is about 1/30th 1/125th as regards next comes aluminum whose world production is around 40 million tons only 
So, in steel you have 1, 3, 5, 0 million tons. Next you have aluminum which is 40 million tons of which India produces 1, 3, 5, 0, 0, 0 today means 1 million 35,000 in 2009. But then it is a big improvement from um, 1980 when the figure was a quarter of a million. So, in the last 30 years we have grown say 5 times. It is not much of a growth. I think China is way way ahead of us. And aluminum is one sector in which India can grow because India has very very good aluminum ores. Of course, the problem is we do not have power which, which one needs for aluminum extraction. So, India is trying to mm, go to other countries like Vietnam or Dubai where power is cheap. India has the uh, know-how and the human resources. So, they are trying to go and open up plants, but it has to come up in India also. Look at the other elements copper, it has grown tremendously from 50,000 in 1980 or so to 650,000 today. Zinc has gone from 1000 to 585,000. Cadmium which is a byproduct of zinc is produced large amount today. Lead also has gone up from 35,000 to 61,000. The problem with copper zinc lead is that in India the ores are very limited. But if once we have the know-how, we can always import the concentrates and produce them in India, which, which some companies are doing. So, all I can say is that they, we have a long way to go in non-ferrous metals production. Now, India has had a fantastic history to which I will refer to a little later. Our present is not bad, but I think our future uh, has to be much brighter. This is just to repeat that world production of aluminum is 40 million tons per year and steel is 35, 1, million tons per year. Okay. Now, let me come to the learning objectives of the first module where I am talking about the history of metals. First is to discuss past, present and future of non-ferrous metals production in India. Then to discuss fundamental principle no, I am sorry, I am talking about the, um, the learning objectives of the course. Discuss past, present and future of non ferrous metal production in India. To discuss fundamental principles of extraction and refining of non ferrous metals. To understand applications of thermodynamics and kinetics. To discuss extraction of groups of metals according to modes of occurrence of nature of main starting compounds and then to discuss energy and environment related issues in metal production. Now, to, to try to do a bit of that whenever I talk about a metal or a group of metals, but I will dis discuss them with a lot more emphasis at the end of the course, because today anything we do, we have to keep in background environmental angle, the energy angle. So, that will come at the end of the course. We start the course and that is the main subject now, a brief history of non-ferrous metal production in India and some of our remarkable achievements in the past. I do not know how many of you are aware that India has had a very rich tradition in metal production non ferrous metal production as well as production of iron steel. Unfortunately, we are very good in forgetting our past and we had forgotten everything until in the 19th century some British historians started to dig out something about our past. They were there scattered in the literature here and there, but of course, the British did a very very thorough research and you have heard about William Jones. There was a colonial Todd who wrote a history of Rajasthan and many of the early uh, metal activities were in Rajasthan area. I will come to that. Uh, I do not know whether you are aware that India had forgotten Ashoka also. 
until 17th or 18th century nobody ever talked about emperor ashoka people had remembered buddha because the buddhist had maintained a tradition ashoka was forgotten it is only the britishers who found in inscriptions on pillars and monuments and stupas repeatedly a reference to somebody called priyodarshi that priyodarshi came again and again and again and they started asking the question who is this priyodarshi who says he has erected these uh, monuments these stupas who who is leaving instructions then only they finally found this priyodarshi was no other than emperor ashoka who either assumed the title or people gave him that title you know priyodarshi means good to look at some say it also means one who looks at others affectionately because he always considers himself father to his subjects just imagine we have forgotten ashoka so no wonder we have forgotten many other things but now a lot of research is being done and in last 50 years or so many many papers have been written books have been written and i am going to give you information that i have collected from three books all written by professor a k biswas who was a very dear colleague of mine in iit um, kanpur uh, he is a great name in mineral beneficiation area but he's also written some fantastic books all published by dk print world world limited and very highly acknowledged one is on minerals and metals in ancient india volume 1 archaeological evidence the other one minerals and metals in ancient india volume 2 which he wrote uh, in collaboration with his wife sulekha biswas who is a scholar in sanskrit so she could uh, read and uh, and translate the sanskrit old sanskrit uh, scripts and third minerals and metals in pre modern india which means um, before the britishers came so from the middle ages to the britishers so i have collected some information from these books which i would like to share with you see there is uh, evidence and uh, the, this uh, this has been given in the book that i have just mentioned that let me talk about iron steel first because that's also important all of these courses are non ferrous metals let me start with iron steel there is evidence that india exported 5000 kg of steel towards the end of the 7th century and nearly 25000 kg of iron ore iron ware at that time there was a dutch establishment in india the dutch establishment have left records that 20000 ingots of wood steel went out every year went out of india every year in the later part of the 18th century later part of 18th century which is pretty close down remember there were 10000 iron and steel furnaces all over india each producing 200 kg per day most of them were done by tribals they were in forest areas and so india was producing each of them produced 20 tons per year 
assuming 100 working days per year. So, India was producing easily 200,000 tons per year of iron steel. This continued till about 18th century. Then it declined and the decline was obviously for two reasons. Firstly, the Britishers did not want the local uh, iron and steel manufacture and they were importing much cheaper uh, steel from England. And secondly, all the indigenous production was based on charcoal. For, for centuries, India used charcoal to produce and charcoal was becoming more expensive. India never went um, in, the, in the coal route, that coal to coke and reduce iron ore. It was always charcoal based. That is why we, we made very special sponge iron, very pure sponge iron. And um, we have examples of the iron pillar of Delhi, which is still existing. So, India had a thriving uh, iron and steel thing, but it, it had to die. It died a natural death, I would say. Incidentally, the first um, iron works of India um, that came up when we had ISCO, we had Bhadrabati. Uh, you have heard about Visesharaya, the great engineer. Uh, Bhadrabati, that was also initially charcoal based. The idea was that uh, they, they, they would use forests and they will regrow trees, but of course that, that could not be sustained. That so that has gone out now. So this is uh, was the iron and steel scene. About the non-ferrous metals, I'll come a little later as to where uh, did India stand. Now, let us talk briefly about the history of metals and then, then uh, you will know how things have come after another. Until about 7000 years ago, which is that is up to about 5000 BC, we had the period called Paleolithic age or Old Stone Age. Old st Stone Age was when uh, men were hunting and gathering food from forests. They were not, they hadn't settled down. The settlement started around 5000 BC, and we said that was the beginning of the new Stone Age, Neolithic. Lithos means stone. And humans learned the art of farming and domestication of animals. Now, once humans learned that they can grow plants to grow food and they can they don't have to run around after wild animals they can actually have some animals at one place who will multiply then they could stay at one place so the settlements began to appear that was the new stone age then they learned to use the fire discovery of fire, baked pottery, cooked food, these are all this distinctive of a new stone age. There was no metals in the scene at that time. Around 3500 BC, there was the beginning of ancient civilization in Egypt, Mesopotamia and Indus Valley was more or less of the same time. Although we say the first civilization came in in, in the uh, in Mesopotamia, which is today Iraq. So, and our Indus Valley civilization, which we call Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, that covered the northeast of India, that covered what is present day, present day Pakistan, and Mohenjo-daro is today in Pakistan. I will show you the area. There is a reason why the development took place in that north west of India, because it was close to the Middle East, Central Asia. So, that is where things were happening and there was 
cross fertilization of ideas migration of people we have we, we have heard that actually aryans came from uh, central asia some people say it's a wrong theory and there is a lot of evidence to say it didn't happen there was no such thing maybe people went from here to there or people were always there so i wouldn't go into those theories but it is true that it was almost simultaneous egypt mesopotamia indus valley and china also china also had the beginning of uh, a metallurgy more or less at the same time but the harappa civilization of uh, india was a very vast area it covered and uh, i'll give you some maps to show that how largely uh, extended it was and it went on for many many centuries also the earliest reference to metals in india of course is in the um, rigvedas but before that let me see here yeah let me go back to this chalcolithic uh, i have talked about your uh, neolithic period neolithic period is where people are using stone then comes the chalcolithic period when chalcos means copper and lithos means stone means they found copper how they found copper i'll come to that later on firstly copper can be found in nature sometimes in a native state and some people must have found that so they were beginning to make tools or implements or weapons using not only stone but also copper and the pyramids were built entirely by using copper implements which is very strange in a huge structures built only of copper and there is a reference in the history the ramesses to when he went and attacked hittites hittites were another civilization slightly towards the north east hittites had by that time got iron weapons but the egyptians didn't have it was a draw nobody really won in that uh, war but the egyptians did not have iron and you know iron came much later in between we had the bronze age about 1500 to 2000 bc there was discovery of tin mixed with copper to produce bronze which actually is a very strong metal strong alloy which is also corrosion resistant many people say that there was no reason why steel would replace bronze because in many many things bronze is as good as steel if not better especially in terms of strength the only reason that steel became much more popular and more common is simply because there's much more iron ore available a lot more steel was produced and the cheaper than bronze otherwise bronze was an excellent alloy at that time now in india the first reference to metals is found in rigveda rigveda of course is the first literature of ancient india it wasn't written down but you know it it went from mouth to mouth and they say rigveda was written when there was a transition uh, between this uh, new stone age and chalcolithic period means people were still hunter gatherers they are settling down and they are beginning to use metals and there is a word called ayas uh, in rigveda mentioned very frequently and some people think that the uh, the word ayas means um, iron but uh, it's been argued by orun biswas and others that actually ayas should not mean iron it really means metal because there are references to rigveda saying black ayas and red ayas means one means uh, iron the other means copper so this 
I could also be in the mid bronze. Where did iron come from? Iron actually came because from the sky sometimes the meteorites fall to ground and that is almost pure iron. So, the, our ancients had found native iron here and there and they found there was a superior metal. So, the familiarity with the iron had come uh, like that. Of course, there was always familiarity with gold and silver because gold is available in the native state and very often uh, there, there were huge amounts of gold that could be collected from rivers which carried gold particles or they made gold exposed on rock surfaces and you know in South America uh, they, there were tons of gold that the Spanish uh, collected. So, the gold was also known um, uh, pretty early um, to humans. Now, as you guys familiarity with metals, gold was one of the first um, that uh, humans uh, collected and how do you know this? Because there are many ancient graves where we have found along with many things there is gold ornaments of course, a very crude sort of thing, but there was gold. Then came copper and silver came little later because silver had to be separated from gold it is always with gold, lead, tin, mercury, iron. Why they have come one after another I will discuss uh, little later. There is a very interesting story as to how the first copper came. It is believed that copper was first uh, discovered in uh, Egypt, where they used an ore called malachite as eye shadow. Means Cleopatra and all would use this black uh, ore to um, around their eyes. You know, you will see in pictures that is malachite. This ore containing this mineral is found plenty in Egypt and what apparently happened that in some rituals apparently it fell into fire and in the fire it got reduced because in the fire it broke into copper um, oxide and then there was um, carbon there and it got into copper and once they found that this was a new material they learned by trial and error to produce large quantities and they believe that that is how copper production started. There is something very interesting though because the melting point of copper is 1200 degrees around 1200 degrees. It is not easy to get 1200 degrees because 1200 degrees normally needs bellows like you put a fire it will go up to 900 and 1000 and then if you blow air by using bellows then the temperature will go up. Somehow they had found a way to do this. I do not know how they found it and they will do that. Now I think I made a mistake the melting point of copper uh, sorry is not 1200 it is actually near 1100, 10,083. Yes, yeah, sorry, melting point is 10,083. But to make the process happen, you need to go slightly higher temperatures, the, which needs bellows. And these bellows, they have found the Egyptians have found some way of getting to the temperature of 1100 or 1200 degrees, and they were making copper. How did they make bronze? The obviously, bronze to make bronze. Perhaps there was some ore where there was already some tin and tin got reduced, got mixed up with copper that is how um, bronze came. You know that ores are seldom pure minerals, there are always mixtures of minerals and all kinds of impurities called gang and sulphides are particularly known to dissolve all kinds of things and that is how we seldom get copper, lead, zinc 
in the form of pure minerals or pure ores. They are always mixed together. The, of course, the composition vary from one location to other. So, when they were doing produce, trying to produce copper, sometimes they ended up producing tin, sometimes they ended up having also other metals, produce other alloys, but gradually they learned as to which ore from which location will produce what. They did not, people did not very clearly knew the distinction between one metal, another metal, another alloy, but they were beginning to use copper and bronze quite extensively in the beginning. There was no zinc in the scene and I will come and uh, discuss that later. Around 2500 to 1500 BC, there was accidental production of copper and there was accidental production of iron. Now, about accidental production of iron, I will come in my, in the, when I continue this lecture in the next hour. So, what have I done so far? Let me conclude. I have tried to give you uh, an introduction talking about the importance of non-ferrous metals. To tell you the state of non-ferrous metal production in our country today is not unsatisfactory, but we have a long way to go. We have had a history in non-ferrous metal production to which we I still have not come and now I will discuss it in the next, next time. But this is a course you simply cannot ignore. To be a metallurgist, you have to know about iron steel production, you also have to know about non ferrous metal production. So, let me stop here now and I will continue with you in the next class. Thank you.